my name is Patrick McGuire, and I'd like to welcome you to Volume 2 of our series on prophecy, Overcoming the Paradigms of Prophecy. I would like to review uh, a few of the terms we used last time. For instance, when we are going through Scripture and you see the term God in Scripture on the screen, I will pronounce the Hebrew term Elohim. Keeping in mind that God is not the name of the Father, it is His title and it means Mighty One. Also, when we reference the Old Testament, I'll use the term Tanakh. When we reference the New Testament, I'll use the term Brit Hadashah. Once again, when we split up the Bible according to the Old Testament and the New Testament, it seems like there's some kind of a division and replacement that's, that's taken place, and that simply is not the case with, with Scripture. In Volume 2, we're going to cover two chapters in Scripture. We're going to look at Daniel 7 and the four beasts that are spoken of in Daniel's vision, and also Revelation 13, and we'll look and identify, look at and identify the ten-horned beast. In Daniel chapter 7, we will see one of the visions given to the prophet Daniel concerning the last days. Daniel's vision consists of four beasts, a lion, a bear, a panther, or possibly a leopard, and a composite beast of some kind. The last is a wild-looking creature that is simply not a real animal or beast. Now the fact is, all prophecy is symbolic by nature. Now when I say symbolic, I don't mean symbolic to the point of irrelevancy. On the contrary, it's, sim it's symbolism with great, great meaning. All the symbols used represent real things, real people, real nations, and real empires. One important issue I would like to point out is in prophecy and in almost all of Scripture, the focus is on Israel. It's, the focus is on the land and the people of Israel and those surrounding nations. The problem with most Bible teachers today is that they mistakenly believe that prophecy should be taken literally when it is symbolic, and also they think that prophecy focuses on Christianity and on Europe or the United States. As we go through this series, I will demonstrate that prophecy does not focus on the United States. It does not focus on New York City. It doesn't focus on Disneyland or Hollywood or its people. Prophecy and all of Scripture focuses on Israel, on the land of Israel, the surrounding nations, the people of Israel, and the enemies of Israel. I will remind you of this as we go through this, this study, and it will be abundantly clear, I believe, as we do so. Much of the prophecy given in Scripture, such as in this chapter, Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 7, is very contemporary for us today. You will be reading today's newspaper and seeing the evening news with this chapter as one of the main focuses. Let's look in Daniel chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay on his bed, then he wrote the dream down and related the following summary of it. Okay, we're given the time frame for this vision. It's in the first year of Belshazzar, which is approximately 555 B.C. Daniel saw a dream and visions in his mind as he lay in bed, and he wrote it down. And the following is a summary of that dream. Verse 2, Daniel said, I was looking in my vision, and behold, the four winds of heaven we're stirring up the great sea. What is the great sea? That's a good question. Now, the great sea is sometimes another name for the Mediterranean Sea, but a figurative reference, which is what we're dealing with here in prophecy, a figurative rep uh, reference represents a conglomeration of Gentile nations surrounding Israel in Scripture. As you can see on the screen, Revelation 17, verse 15, it says, The waters which you saw are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues, and that's what we see here. The winds of heaven, the four winds of heaven are very interesting. The Hebrew word for winds is ruach. It is the same word in scripture that's used for spirit. So what we're looking at here really is the spirit of heaven stirring up the surrounding Gentile nations around Israel. Elohim is in complete control of this situation. As a matter of fact, Elohim is causing this to happen. As you can see in the Strong's, that term winds is translated spirit in most occasions. So that's what we should be looking at. The spirit of Elohim stirring up the people. Verse 3, 
It states, and four great beasts were coming up from the sea, different from one another. Okay, these are four different beasts of varying people. They're all different, but they're all united in some particular manner. The text says the beasts arise from the sea together. Verse 17 tells Daniel that their arrival is a future event. Looking at Daniel 7, verse 17, it says these great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. Now, the identification of the four beasts is vital to determining the enemies of Israel and of Elohim in these last days. The descriptions of these beasts are given according to their origins in antiquity. Their identity is realized by using scripture and also by looking at secular history. Let's look at verse 4. The first was like a lion and had the wings of an eagle. I kept looking until its wings were plucked. And it was lifted from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. A human mind also was given to it. The identity of the winged lion seems almost too contemporary. It's, uh, it's almost difficult for me to stand before you and state with as much certainty as I have of the nation being spoken of here. By the time we get through the majority of this series, if you bear with me, you will likely agree. The lion with the wings of an eagle represents Babylon. This is their ancient symbol, and Babylon is modern-day Iraq. Among the ruins of ancient Babylon, one can see a proud winged lion standing on a pedestal. This was the symbol of that empire. The wings of the lion represent the strength of its army. This beast, unlike the two mentioned, has some things happen to it over time. Daniel said, I kept looking at it. In other words, the lion changed as he kept looking at it. Something actually happens to this lion. It says its wings were plucked. Keep in mind that we're looking at what is now modern-day Iraq. This is a reference to the defeat of Iraq within the last few years by the United States and other allied armies. This is a reference to the defeat of Saddam Hussein. It says, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man. When we defeated Iraq, we took away their radical Islamic uh, government and we replaced them with a secular government. So as it says, it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man and a human heart, or excuse me, a human mind, or the King James Version says, or a man's heart was given to it. Iraq is being given the government of a secular state, not a religious one. The United States is using Iraq to build a secular democracy in the Middle East. This passage of the lion with two wings is an excellent picture of what we see in Iraq in these days today. And if I'm correct, and I believe I am, then this is a message that these last days are closer than we might think. Let's look at the next vision. Verse 5, And behold another beast, a second one resembling a bear. And it was raised up on one side, and three ribs were in its mouth between its teeth. And thus they said to it, Arise, devour much meat. Now the history of the kingdoms help identify them and their modern day counterparts. Remember I, I mentioned that we're given descriptions from antiquity of modern day nations. The bear represents the kingdom of Media Persia. And that kingdom is modern day Iran. The bear originally had two sides. It, it raised itself uh, first on one side, and that was the Mede Empire. The Mede Empire d uh, conquered Babylon. The Persians then took over Egypt and the rest of the world ruled by Babylon. Within a few decades, the kingdom was almost exclusively Persian. It says the bear had three ribs in his mouth between its teeth. And the three kingdoms that it represents are the kingdoms that were overthrown to originally constitute this empire. That would have been Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. The modern nation of Iran is pictured as a beast that appears in the last days. And Iran poses a threat to Israel and the rest of the world all by themselves, but especially as a part of the Muslim empire. Let's look at verse 6. After this I kept looking, and behold, another one like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. This four-headed leopard represents the Greek kingdom, that was divided after the death of Alexander the Great. Four generals divided the kingdom because they knew they couldn't handle the whole thing by themselves. 
Cassander took Macedonia, Lysimachus took Asia Minor, Seleucus took Syria, and Ptolemy took Egypt. Four wings represents the army of each division of the kingdom. These four nations still exist today. They are Macedonia, Turkey, which was Asia Minor, Syria, and Egypt. Each of these four kingdoms were conquered by the Muslim armies early in the empire's inception. Today, these four nations are today strongly con uh, controlled by Muslim majorities or Muslim influence. Each of these four nations were conquered by the Muslim empire not long after Muhammad and the Muslim religion. If we look at the ancient nations of the leopard, Macedonia was defeated by the Muslims in 638 AD. Asia Minor, which is now Turkey, was defeated by the Muslims in 641. Syria defeated by the Muslims in 638 and Egypt in 639. If you'll notice that the other beasts that we've mentioned so far are all nations that were conquered by the ancient Arab nation and were forced to become Muslim. In verse 7 of Daniel 7, it says, After this I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong, and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And it was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. This strange beast with the ten horns represents the Arab nation, which was the beginning of the Muslim empire as a whole. More attention is given to this fourth beast than the other three all put together. This section is very important to us because we are living in the time when the ten toes of Daniel 2 and the ten horns of this beast have been brought to world prominence. The beast is described as dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. This beast, which represents the Muslim empire, is characterized by strength. The strength of this empire is evidenced by the willingness of the people to die for their beliefs and to die for their false god. It's well known that most of the 9-11 hijackers and most suicide bombers are Saudi Arabian. It says it had huge iron teeth. This is emblematic of the determination of this beast. This unusual beast, which corresponds to the feet of the image in Daniel chapter 2, uh, the feet with the ten toes in Daniel chapter 2, we're given more information about the beast in the next verse. It says in verse 8, While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man in a mouth uttering great boasts. Before the arrival of the little horn, it says that three of the horns were, pu were pulled out by the roots. Now, Psalm 83 gives us the identity of this ten-horned beast. Let's look at Psalm 83, starting at verse 1. It says, O Elohim, do not remain quiet, do not be silent, and O Elohim, do not be still. For behold, thine enemies make an uproar, and those who hate thee have exalted themselves. They make shrewd plans against thy people and conspire against thy treasured ones. They have said, Come, and let us wipe them out as a nation, that the name of Israel be remembered no more. Verse 5, For they have conspired together with one mind. Against thee do they make a covenant. Okay, now let's take a look at these conspirators that are mentioned here in Psalm 83. There are ten of them. Verse 6, the tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gebel and Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre. Assyria also is joined with them. They have become a help to the children of Lot, Selah. Now these ten nations are ancient enemies of Israel and can be traced to the Saudi Arabian people today. The Saudi Arabian people are not a single blood people. It is known that genetically it has been shown that they are a conglomerate of other peoples. Now this next passage asks Elohim to deal with the ten in the same way that he destroyed three nations previously. In verse 9, he says, Deal with them as with Midian, as, as with Sisera and Jabin at the torrent of Kishon, who were destroyed at Endor, who became as dung for the field. Remember in verse 8, it says, three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. He says to destroy these ten horns in the same way you destroyed three horns 
previously. And that's what he's speaking of. Notice now how the psalm ends. Verse 11. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, and all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, Let us possess for ourselves the pastures of Elohim. O my Elohim, make them like the whirling dust, like chafe in the wind. Now I mentioned that this is related to the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2. Let's look at how that particular statue is, destro is destroyed. It says in chapter 2, verse 35, Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all crushed at the same time and became like chafe from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. See in verse 13 where he says, Make them like the whirling dust, like chafe before the wind. It says they became like chafe from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. <clears throat> Daniel 2 further ties the nations in Psalm 83 to those of the last days just before the return of Messiah. The little horn is one that comes up later on the beast. This little horn is Muhammad. We're given more information that identifies this entity as Muhammad in verses 19 through 24. It says in that verse once again, In this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man. This describes the human intelligence of Muhammad. His intelligence was not scriptural wisdom, but the intelligence of a man, a brilliant man following a false god, and a mouth speaking pompous words. This denotes the blasphemy that Muhammad spoke and perpetrated unto others. He taught a false god that claims to be the god of Abraham, but not of Isaac and Jacob. He taught that Jews and Christians were infidels, worthy only of death or servanthood. He taught that his god did not have a son. He taught that God allows rape, and promotes war as a way of promulgating his beliefs. His blasphemies are indeed great. Let's look at verse 9. And I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took, its, took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels were a burning fire. Now this scene shifts to heaven, and the throne of Elohim is revealed. The same scene is described in Revelation 1, Verses 13 through 15. And in the middle of the lamp stands one like a son of man, clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, and girded across his breast with a golden girdle. And his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze, when it has been caused to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. The Ancient of Days is Elohim. His garment white as snow, that, that's his attributes of holiness and righteousness. His throne was a fiery flame, that speaks of judgment. Its wheels a burning fire, that speaks of the restless energy and restless power of Elohim. So look at verse 10. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat, and the books were opened. This is the setting for the judgment of the beast. Verse 11, then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. The emphasis here on this kingdom is not at its beginning, but at its later reign. Now keep in mind this beast with the ten horns existed long before Muhammad. It's not until the little horn came up later that these ten beasts actually gained, uh, these ten horns actually gained prominence and became one strong beast. It was the charisma, imagination, and power behind Muhammad that gave the beast the life it needed to conquer and reign over Israel and much of the world. Verse 12, As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. Now the first, each of the first three beasts at one time ruled the world. First Babylon, then Persia, then Greece. But they were all overthrown and defeated. However, they were given an extension as being a part of the Muslim empire. Verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up on the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Yeshua Messiah is given the power to overcome the Gentile nations and establish his kingdom. We see that Yeshua Messiah is the stone cut without hands in Daniel chapter 2. 
which we're not going to go there for the sake of time. Let's look at verse 14. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all the people, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. Messiah is going to reign on earth forever. Many Bible teachers and pastors tend to leave most of us with the impression that the kingdom of Elohim is up in the heavens somewhere, that's, that it's up in the clouds. But the word of Elohim makes it very clear that his kingdom will be here on earth. Let's look at Micah chapter 4, starting at verse 1. And it will come about in the last days that the mountain of the house of Yahweh will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills, and the peoples will stream to it. And many nations will come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh and to the house of the Elohim of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the Torah, even the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, and never again will they train for war. And each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid, for the mouth of the Yahweh of hosts has spoken. Let's look at verse 15. As for me, Daniel, my spirit was distressed within me, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. Okay, Daniel was greatly disturbed by this vision. He knew the Israelites would be captive for a total of 70 years, and there were about 15 years remaining. Daniel and his fellow captives probably thought this had to be their mindset. They were going to go back to Jerusalem. They were going to set up the temple. Everyone's going to repent and turn back to Elohim. Messiah is going to come, and the kingdom will be here. This was what Daniel was thinking. However, this particular vision told him that is not what was going to happen. Daniel was grieving over this. Verses 16 and 17, I approached one of those who were standing by and began asking him the exact meaning of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. These great beasts, which are four in number, are four kings who will arise from the earth. These four beasts represent kingdoms and also kings. Throughout scripture, when a king is mentioned or a kingdom, it could be uh, interchangeable. You cannot refer to just a king or a kingdom separately. The two are like two sides of a coin or two sides of a door. They are a reference to the same thing. This also applies to the kingdom of Elohim. Verse 18, But the saints of the highest one will receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever for all ages to come. Now the saints being referred to here, the Hebrew word is Kaddish. It means holy ones. Or saints. Holy means set apart. It's ones that are set apart for Elohim. Verse 19, Then I desired to know what the exact meaning is of the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, with its teeth of iron and its claws of bronze, and which devoured, crushed, and trampled down the remainder with its feet. And the meaning of the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up, and before which three of them fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth uttering great boasts, and which was larger in appearance than its associates. Everything here speaks of power and fierceness. The ferocity and determination of the beast with its iron teeth, teeth and brass nails is mentioned once again. The ten horns on the beast are the ten ancient peoples mentioned in Psalm 83. Edom, the Ishmaelites, Moab, the Hagrites, Gebel, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, Tyre, and Assyria. These people were all absorbed by the Arabians and the Muslim Empire. Another mention is made of the three horns here who fell before the little horn had come up. This further embeds the tie with Psalm 83, since that psalm prays for and describes the destruction of three nations like the ten listed. If you remember, the three nations that were destroyed were Midian, Sisera, and Jabin. Verse 21, I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. Now Muhammad and his legacy have waged war and have been against the Elohim of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob since 622 A.D., this little horn has been very successful. And unfortunately, we're out of time for this segment. We're going to pick up in Daniel chapter 7 uh, next time at verse 22, and from there we'll go on to Revelation 13. I hope you join us, and may Elohim greatly bless you.